seating in the back. So we have two seats right up here in front if you'd like to come sit here. If you don't, then the, the overflow room, same in that corner. The overflow room is in the back. We'll try to call. Uh, what number is it again, Tyler? 220. 220. You can listen to it there and come on in. We'll be calling names as you need. Bob? And I apologize. I didn't want to. I was sure you Understood. 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 Uh, Senator Saviello, Representative Welch, uh, other committee members, thank you. I'm uh, Bob Klotz uh, with a name that leads me to make reservations as Smith. <laughs> so I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. We've heard lots of facts here today, and I know that that's been a request to speak to it, but I'm going to come from a slightly different place. I live in South Portland. I'm a supporter of the Clear Skies Ordinance, a, city, a citizen and city council supported air quality ordinance that has led to more bullying by a reported good neighbor, the local and international oil industry who are now suing the city. To be back here with this re recycled legislation feels like another form of bullying, um, both with what I view as a highly suspect legislative process and by the corporate powers who are committed to disrespecting the will of the people and destroying the wildness of Maine for nothing less than overt greed. At times, private citizens such as myself have been cri criticized for expressing emotion in settings such as this. As a health care provider, I know that the expressions of feeling is essential to optimal health. So I need to say that I am very angry that this process is going on again. Many of us spent hours and days and weeks and months working on this over years. And to be back in these halls again is frankly nothing less than offensive. I really ask that you again respect the will of the people, literally thousands of people who signed petitions, who came to these hearings, who spoke to you individually as I have done in my email and personal communications, and insist that you protect us. This activity does not protect us. The facts that we've heard reinforce that this does not protect us. So I ask you to work with us as we have worked with you over the years to accept that the risk that is being proposed here is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none? We're running out of time. Ask away. Representative Campbell. Thank you. Um, well, it's interesting. Um, have you reviewed the 1991 rules? On mining, I have not. Um, I'm a private citizen who was a very busy, employed I person, and no, doesn't I, I get understand. into the details. Uh, but in, in fact, we went through this process. Um, the rules weren't accepted, and we reverted back to the 1991 rules, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically inconsistent with the statute. So that's why we're back here, trying to do uh, uh, the people's business in, in, a, in a form and order that. Um, we're expected to do. And your question so is? The fact that these rules are, um, are before us is, is an important process, piece of the process. If we were to deny these rules, we'd revert back to something that we, we have that's inconsistent. I'm, I'm kind of confused about how one might suggest, not you mm. or, or anyone, that we that we conclude this process in a way that's that's productive and consistent with the statute. So if you if you would have any suggestions on what else we would do might might be helpful. Well Representative Campbell, I appreciate uh, again I, I am not familiar with the nuances of that particular legislation. My understanding as a private citizen with the information that's available to me, uh, having participated in this process through the years really thought this issue was done in a way uh, that it was done and that to me this just appears to be it being foisted upon us again by a special interest group who didn't get the they wanted. Um, now there's obviously more to it, there's lots of details, we've looked at these facts, but when push comes to shove, the gut says we should not be blowing the tops off of mountains in Maine and putting uh, the, all of us at risk to the degree that the legislation that I'm aware of uh, puts it at. And if the 1991 law does that, then yes, I, apparently the conversation needs to continue. But there's just so much, uh, frankly, suspect about this process that just concerns me. So I appreciate the ability to speak to that. Good, thank you. Thank, thank you. Other questions? 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is Sarah back? She's going to get bumped to the bottom. Okay. Hillary Lister, and then John Diefenbacher Crow, and then Sherry Verrill. Is Hillary here? Hillary was around. I saw her earlier. She coming? Uh, do, you have, do you have testimony? I do have testimony. Give it to Tyler. Uh, clerk. He's right there. Oh, Stone morning. Good morning, members Good of the morning. committee, Chair Saviello and Representative Walsh and members of the committee. Thank you for your time. My testimony is specifically addressing the waste handling provisions of the proposed mining rules that were not addressed after the rules were originally prevent, presented earlier. Um, the particular concerns are, as has been mentioned earlier, the particular type of mining wastes that we would be seeing in Maine if we're looking at any sort of copper mining especially. So um, some of the byproducts from the sort of mining of minerals that occur in Maine can include sulfuric acid, cyanide, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, and uranium and these are wastes that are for the most part regulated as special wastes and subject to much more stringent regulation and oversight than what's being proposed in these rules for what could be allowed in the wet mining waste storage um, as several people have pointed out there's particular concerns about the 30-year post closure period that's allowed um, also just concerns about the impact on mining wastes on main landfills. If this is going to be dealt with off-site, it's significant volumes of waste. I have some excerpts from a report from the EPA discussing some of the problems with disposing the large amounts of mineral processing waste that can be pr produced from a mining site and how that can overwhelm a landfill. I think part of what we're looking at really needs to be determining how if Maine's landfills can handle the quality and type of waste that would be being produced, if these wastes would be going to Maine landfills, and if the wastes are being kept in wet storage, that there be similar sort of regulation, oversight, and testing as there would be for any other special waste storage facility. Um, I think we can just look at the other waste regulations, especially for handling hazardous and special wastes here in Maine. Um, and I just, one report I didn't include but I'd be happy to send along <coughs> is the radiation levels of mining wastes, um, specifically from copper mining. Um, you're looking at anywhere from 12 to up to 82 picocuries per gram of radium. Main landfills do not currently monitor for radiation. In other states such as Pennsylvania where they handle mining waste at the landfills, there are requirements to test for radiation. Um, so if these types of wastes are going to be generated in large qu quantity and disposed of in Maine, we need much more stringent regulations around the disposal of these materials, similar to what we already have for these materials when they're produced by other industries. And I think my three minutes is up, so thank you for your time. You. Questions? I have one. Yes. Um, because uh, obviously in the various conversations, we've heard a lot about wet waste rock, and I say it right, wet mineral waste unit say that three times fast yeah. um, I think I can't speak for this group but I suspect that's going to come out so what okay. I would ask you to do is look at your testimony with the concept that that will no longer be a viable option okay and just see what else you might want to change because we're just quickly reading through that you, you cite that many times that is the primary concern definitely though I do think that waste handling in general we should look at the byproducts and treat them as we do other special wastes here in the state thank you thank you um, where are we John Diefenbacher Crow and then we have Sherry Verrill and then we're to the next page we Doug Brown Sid Courier switch Sid Corian Courier and, Courier and, and Peter Breen and Doger Foxtrot Brain? Okay, you're here. Good. That's all I need to know. Welcome, John. Before you leave, let you and I pick a time. Okay. All right. All right. Welcome. 
Well, thank you, Senator Saviel, Representative Welsh, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on the Environment and Natural Resources. My name is John Diefenbacher Crawl. I'm a resident of Old Town, Maine, and I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission. I'm here to offer testimony on behalf of the Commission. We're, we're an intergovernmental body formed by statute in Title 30, Section 6201 to Section 6212, and charged in part with reviewing the effectiveness of the Maine Implementing Act and the social, economic, and legal relationship between the Holton Band of Malice Indians, the Passamaquoddy Tribe, the Penobscot Indian Nation, and the State of Maine. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in LD 146. Wabanaki people's ability to fish, hunt, trap, and gather food and medicine sustained them for thousands of years. Many Wabanaki individuals and their families continue to rely on sustenance harvesting practices to meet their dietary, medicinal, and spiritual needs. The Maine Implementing Act, as I previously cited, explicitly protects Passamaquoddy and Penobscot sustenance fishing under Section 6207, subsection 4. Recently, the Department of Interior solicitor Hillary Tompkins, so she is the highest lawyer for the Department of Interior, um, writing to A.B. Garbeau at General Counsel for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, affirmed the sustenance fishing rights of the Wabanaki tribes in Maine. In order for Wabanaki people to continue to conduct these ancient harvesting practices, they require healthy animal and plant populations free from toxic contamination. The environmental and public health risks posed by metallic mining are well documented. Before any mining rules are adopted, Maine state government should consult with the Wabanaki tribes as required under executive orders issued by Governor Baldacci and Governor LePage, and his is executive order and you see a reference in my testimony. Effective consultation can strengthen tribal state relations and preempt conflicts between the governments. Thank you. Be pleased to answer any questions. Just a clarification, the way you checked it on it, you were neither for nor against, so you're just making a statement. Neither for nor against. We're mostly, we're very concerned about compliance with the executive order on tribal consultation, which unfortunately we're seeing routinely violated. Thank you. Any other questions? John. Thank you. For, oh, Representative Campbell. Thank you. So uh, what you suggested, and which apparently is, is fact they weren't uh, consulted. To our knowledge, no. And I think you'll have some representatives of tribal government speaking to you today. Good. Thank you. You can ask them directly. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Senator Cabrini. Thank you. Um, is there a formal mechanism for this consultation? Is it, uh, do we need to set aside time in our committee's agenda to do this, or how does that work? Can you educate me about that? Thank you, Senator Breen. Uh, well, one, and I think one of the dilemmas we have is, of course, this is an executive branch. This is the governor of the state of Maine. So part of the question is, what is the legislative branch's role in seeing that an executive branch executive order is enforced? Um, but I think it's important, though, for you to be mindful of it. I think it's a relevant question when you have the Department of Environmental Protection before you and, you know, asking them procedures, did they, in fact, comply with that executive order that they are subject to? Um, I would say, you know, the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission is working with the LePage administration on doing exactly what you're talking about. There need to be essentially policies and procedures to make the executive order um, work. <laughs> And those are in, in uh, slow, um, slow, but they're in the actually process. Actually, meeting with the governor next week, in and I works. imagine we will be talking about that among other things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, Sherry uh, Barrel. Sherry, sorry about that. It's yours. I got to talk to you. Good Sorry. Good morning still. Okay. <laughs> yes, good morning. My name is Shree Verrill, and this is my first time testifying, so I'm really nervous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I might cry. 
Oh, um, I thought the scariest part was going to be standing here, but as I've been listening to others, the scariest part is thinking that <laughs> that some of you might not actually care about the water and the health of the environment as much as I do. So, are you a good catch? I am a good catch, and All I have right, an extra tissue, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank uh, you. Kat. Anybody with a teddy bear? I work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pushing 40, and I need a teddy bear to do this. Okay. You're doing so, fine. <laughs> thank you. So, um, I'm from Otisfield, which is in Oxford County. Um, back in the 1900s, I went to the College of Atlantic, and I'm currently finishing a graduate degree in biology at the University of Southern Maine. Um, where I live in Portland. And so I put together some scientific testimony thinking that would be what is most needed here. And um, here I am getting emotional. So I'm just going to read now. <laughs> <sighs> Greetings to the Senator Saviello and Representative Welch. Thank you for hearing my opposition to LD 146 concerning metallic mineral exploration and metal mining. I speak as a biologist and a citizen concerned for the clean water and health of current and future Mainers. As such, I wish to highlight three major reasons for opposition. Mining and sulfide deposits create sulfuric acid and pollutes water through runoff laden with heavy metals and pollutes our air when exposed to oxygen through the creation of arsenic. Arsenic and inorganic arsenic compounds get into the air and become deposited in the water and soil during industrial operations, such as ore mining. Polluting groundwater and drinking water with sulfides is a health risk we cannot afford. Ingestion of water contaminated with inorganic arsenic increases adverse effects, such as skin discoloration and lesions, nausea, diarrhea, and abdominal pain, and let's not forget skin cancer, bladder cancer, liver cancer, kidney cancer, and lung cancer. There is no technology to prevent mine drainage. There is no technology to prevent mine drainage or to eliminate these adverse effects. The short-term economic benefit is by far outweighed by the long-term damage to our environment and health risks to our population. I'm 100% in opposition to LD146. Thank you for your time, consideration, and your service. Sitting here all day. Okay. Thank you so much for coming up and speaking with us, because it, it, it's what we're here for. So, uh, Are there questions? Yes, Representative Duchesne. Thank you, uh, Representative. If it's any consolation, I get the same way when I have to present a bill on taxation. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you don't taxation. cry. <laughs> you should see. <laughs> do you um, do you have any scientific information you wanted to bring to us? Uh, did, did you do anything on that that you didn't yeah. think you had time to present now? Or? I would say that the interplay between groundwater and surface water is so dynamic, especially in the face of increasing um, weather extremities, drought, and um, heavy storm events.
<laughs> Excuse me? How many jobs will this provide? Just keep going. <laughs> they got it. You go. Keep going. Let it's me done. keep going, okay? Thanks. <laughs> uh, You're a victim of your own. <laughs> really? You are. Uh, okay, there. Well, now, now I've lost my place. You're, you're talking about how many jobs it would create. Yeah, okay, okay. What I wonder is, um, open pit mining requires a skilled and specialized workforce. There are not many in Maine. I feel or fear that the jobs that pay well will come from states and countries where there's a major mi mining industry. And that the, you know, the janitor jobs will go to Mainers. Um, I feel if this committee, last paragraph, approves this project, it will become because a majority chose to disregard rather than grapple with dangerous realities. I sympathize with the obvious desire to better the prospects of people in northern Maine. I wish this project were a way to help do so, but the near certain destructive consequences of it and the flimsy proposed revisions that bespeak enabling rather than safeguarding deserves a vote of no and a move instead towards stronger legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Questions? Oh, Let's see if there are any questions. Can I? Yes, May I please. Yes. Mr. Representative uh, Tucker. You, uh, you mentioned a 90% figure, 90% less <coughs> hazardous or wasteful. A waste of any kind. What is the source of that? Of uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. Well, so I Google that and what do I get? Um, I came last year and I did the work of, of seeking it at that time. I, I, I will get I, that I, I, for you. I will get that for you, okay? Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we'll do one more before lunch. Okay. Sid? Sid, for you. Chairman, plural, and committee members, thank you for allowing us to speak. Um, I'm speaking in opposition um, to this bill. I'm not even sure at this point that either the new or the old regulations can sufficiently protect Maine from this, from this type of mining. My interest in speaking is two reasons. One, for the last several decades, I have worked in a variety of, of uh, ways with conservation organizations regarding um, land and water conservation. The second reason is that I have training as a geologist and that allows me to understand some of the, of the, um, of the processes and the risks. I'm not an expert in any way about mining or in mining regulation. Um, but I'd like to offer just some context for you to to view the comments that you hear and the decisions you have to make. Um, first of all, much, much of what I've written is, uh, has already been said and so that I don't need to go over it. But this is mining, as, as we have heard, about sulfide deposits. Um, and they are the primary deposits of interest in Maine. And they are among the most difficult deposits uh, to manage in my campbell. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking time out of your youthful life to come and participate in the... Sacrifice my GPA. This, yeah, this. <laughs> um, they gave you extra credit, so, they better, we'll write you a note. I guess I don't have a question, but thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you for your time. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, but before I do this, I'm going to let Kathy uh, Scott go. Great job, Sam. And then George Smith. Thank you. I am thrilled to go after Sam Day. I'm a former teacher and he's youth. Uh, Senator Salviello, Representative Welsh, and members of the committee, thank you for listening. My name is Kathy Scott and I live in Mercer. At one time I lived in Aroostook County in Van Buren. 
Some of you may remember I spoke before this committee the last two years in regard to motorized recreational prospecting. Then as today, I'm not going to talk big picture and all of mining. Um, but then, remember, we work together and we found a way to protect the critical spawning habitat of Maine's iconic brook trout. And the Senate and the House gave that effort tremendous support. I believe LD 146 should be consistent with those efforts and I have a couple specific ideas. The responsibility for safeguarding Maine's rivers and ponds shouldn't stop with the little guys, the individual recreational people. Big companies should play by the rules with the same intent. That's only fair and I think it should be legally consistent. To that end, I'm concerned that LD-146 needs some revision at least. To be fair, mining should be excluded anywhere near class AA streams, recreational prospecting is. Because the impacts of industrial mining are greater than individual recreational mining, I'd suggest including class A streams as well. NARPA rules list some water bodies as critical why not exclude them from industrial mining impacts? And some rivers are essential for the restoration of Atlantic salmon, and it makes sense to me to exclude those specifically too. The risks are too great. Motorized recreational prospecting had largely in-stream impacts. This larger scale has a greater area of potential impact. So I would ask you to consider excluding mining in, near, and under those places. Please create a foolproof buffer. Without it, in-stream protections are roughly equivalent to locking only half the doors and keeping your house secure. <coughs> I am a landowner, and I am the daughter of a long line of farmer landowners, and we get a lot of say over our land with restrictions to help the common good. And I'm happily, happy to join with the citizens of Maine assorted, to jointly own assorted public lands. So I would ask you to help assure that my public lands on, in, and next to and under are excluded from mining and its impacts too. Consistency, I think that's got to help and protecting my jointly owned property, that's why I came here today. Mines are forever, or at least their impacts are, so please take the time. I know it's been a lot of time already, but please take the time to get this right. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, George Smith. <laughs> Boy, I sure hope there are props. <laughs> And then, so just so everybody's listening up, Landis, are you here? I am. Are you testifying as an individual or on behalf of Maine Rivers? Maine. Then you'll wait till the end. Sorry, nice try. <laughs> uh, David, I think it's, what do you think? Uh, Sock Alexis? S S S S S yes, that's it. All right, David, you're, you're there after that. Then T.P. Levitt and then uh, Tony Owens. Thank goodness I'm not a lobbyist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that depends. Yeah. I should check and see if you're registered or not. Yeah, if you no, are, then I'm not. Senator Saviello, Representative up. Welch, <laughs> and distinguished <laughs> committee members. Before I begin, I just want to tell you one thing that Senator Saviello carries a heavy, heavy burden because he's my senator. <laughs> and that's a tough job. Yeah, I get paid extra for it. Yeah, you should. Brook Trout. Brook trout are more precious than gold. This artwork is really all you need to see. This brook trout was carved by Alan Dudley, the main game warden. My dad added the hand and painted the catch and release scene. Dad was a real mainer. He didn't think you'd had a very good day of fishing if you didn't take the fish home and eat them. And I subscribed to that for a long time until my wife and I bought a camp up in the North Woods. And all of us, including Dad, uh, finally understood that this brook trout was an important enough resource that we didn't need to eat them all. We still ate a few. We still eat a few, but not very many. And 
I think Dad was very proud of us when we worked together, the Sportsman's Alliance and the legislature, to make the brook dart our state heritage fish. This is just not any fish. In fact, we have 97% of the native brook dart of the left in all of our country. So this isn't just for us. This is for the whole country. Now, brook trout are very sensitive to water quality, temperature. Uh, we're having some trouble with acidity currently. So you've got to be really ca careful and cautious when you're considering any impacts to the water that's, that have these native <coughs> brook trout. And almost all of these are actually in the North Woods. So in memory of my dad and for my grandchildren, I am counting on you, each one of you, every one of you, to protect this precious resource, Maine's native brook trout. Thank you. Question for George. Yes, Senator Breen. I don't think we've had the pleasure of meeting yet, but I've heard about your I've heard time. about you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, thank you for your uh, visual and everything. So um, are you trying to speak for the adoption of these rules? Would you like us to change these rules? Would you like us to <coughs> reject these rules? Could you give us a little more Yes, specific? I had a little session with Senator Saviello to try to figure out what the rules were and to be knowledgeable today. And he actually encouraged me to be more specific, but I don't, I'm not an expert on the rules. Well, I'm counting on you. You're our representative. He's my senator. To make sure that if we are going to have rules, that they protect this resource right here. That's my whole interest. And I'll come to the work sessions. I'd be glad to study it more and offer suggestions. But you have that tough assignment of making sure that we don't lose this resource to mine some other resource. Wish I could help you more, Senator Breen, but I don't know enough. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for the good, good friend? Thank you. Yes, Representative Harlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So there is no guarantee with mining, as there are no guarantees in life. But are you saying, so you're, I guess just to kind of piggyback on Senator Breen's mm -hmm. question, are, would you say that you would be more along the lines of, I think it's the person before you, um, Kathy from Mercer, um, to protect certain streams, or? I, I would definitely be on the side of making sure we don't lose this resource and not risking it in any way. I know nothing's ever guaranteed, uh, but as you look at what the impacts are of mining, uh, I think you've got to look at the worst case scenarios and all the op all the things that might happen, and make sure that as the only state in the nation with this fish, that w this is a precious resource. I wasn't kidding about it being more precious than gold. It's only in our state. No other states have this precious resource. Other places have gold and all these metals, but they don't have this. The benefit there is worth is not worth the risk is what you're I don't saying. think so. Thank you. I have a very, very important question. Oh, no. Where can you get the best eggplant in the state of Maine? Calzaleo Restaurant in Wilton. Oh, it's incredibly is you. in thank your you district. I just needed to check to verify that that was correct. And when Senate, you know, Linda and I write a weekly travel column that's in the KJ and the Sentinel. Done it for four years, and the senator recommended his restaurant in, in Wilton, this Calzaleo. And the first time we went, they said, oh, yeah, Senator, he just comes in and sits down, and we bring him his eggplant parmesan and his, his glass of wine. You know, he's a, just one? And it is. It's a, I've had about four or if, five before I get there. If you get bogged down with this hearing today, I would recommend everybody going up there for dinner because it's extraordinary. Thank you, George. That's right. Since this is the center of the yes. universe, it would be a great place to meet. It is. It's Any not other that questions far from, from here, from either. Mr. Smith. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, George. Uh, David. Then T.P. Levitt. Oh, and I already got her over on this okay. side. Okay. Good. And then T.P. Levitt, then Tony Owens. And then Ian Glass, Peter Gar Garnett. Garrett. Garrett. Sorry about that. Peter Thompson. Oh, sure. Good afternoon, Senator, Representative, members of the committee. My name is David Sokasitz. I live in Portland. Uh, I come to speak. I signed up today neither for nor against, but as I've listened to this and had a chance to review what the regulations are about, I'm against. Uh, three years ago, I was working on a temporary job down in Washington when this idea of gold mining in this mountain in northern Maine came up for the first time in the media. And I was in a fly shop with some guys I've known for 20 years or more. And they had two questions for me. 
how can you expect people to come to a state vacation land when you're turning it into looks like a gravel pit and what kind of nuts do you have running your state um, I stood there and hemmed and hawed a bit but anyway that's what it comes down to you know tourism is our number one industry if you want to chase the tourists away turn the north main woods into a gravel pit mine it I grew up in the Pennsylvania of acid mine drainage and watersheds blown out by old mines and you know the other thing is you got smelters you got to do something with that or to turn it into metal that means smelting it and I've seen mountain sides of Pennsylvania denuded by zinc smelters absolutely barren of all life I've seen that so if you want to do that go ahead but then you won't have the tourists coming here and I noticed uh, the other week the governor was pitching how his budget will be balanced on the backs of tourists paying sales tax. Well, they're not going to pay sales tax. They're not going to be got buying gas in Kittery or Bangor or Eagle Lake or anywhere else in the state. They're going to be going elsewhere with their dollars. So that's what it comes down to is dollars. You can have a few dollars going to a billionaire and his mining company in a couple of years, seven to ten years, and then you'll have a perpetual problem. A couple of suggestions. Number one, from what I could tell skimming the regulations this morning, you are not getting any money out of this at all. I would suggest, since the big fever appears to be that there's gold in that mountain, um, which makes people think like cokeheads or crackheads. I mean, it just makes them crazy. Uh, add an ad valorem tax. And I'm going to suggest $100 an ounce. Every ounce of gold that comes out of there tax it. Put it in trust for remediation. And don't just limit it to the gold, but to every other mineral. At a rate coordinate to the value of the mineral. But an ad valorem tax. Number two, the idea no, of I'm waiting. Sure. Let, me, let me say, I would like you to, could you share with us the rest of your ideas? <laughs> what do you mean? Look at the clock. Right? I see. Time. I so see. So I could see. you share with us the rest of Keep going. Well, okay. Be happy to. I can talk all day. <laughs> but we really, we really don't want you to do that. But if you've got a couple bullet points. I don't, you, understand. I'm and, a, and please, I'm you, a lawyer by trade. My business oh, is no. words. <laughs> okay. I passed up a job opportunity in Washington that would pay me $150,000 a year to start to stay in Maine. That was just last August because I love Maine. I want Maine to be good. So the ad valorem tax. Uh, number two, what's the rush in passing this bill? This is the third time in four years, by my count, that this bill and these regulations, the same regulations, have come up. I mean, this time the, the BEP insulted the legislature by not addressing questions that were posed to it in a letter. Maybe it was informal, but, you know, you're willing to take that. But, you know, what's the rush that it has to be an emergency? I think, I think uh, you need to put some time onto this and get the public input. And the public has spoken. You're going to get lobbyists coming in here saying it's a good idea, but the public is coming in here telling you this is a bad idea. Uh, Martin King, Reverend, Reverend King had it said one time, a riot is the voice of the unheard. Uh, anyway. If you'd summarize, that'd be great. Okay, I'm trying to. I mean, I'm looking at my notes. You could certainly submit this to us in written. Testimony. I think I, I think I will do that. But the point is, is the mining is a hit and run thing. We've got seven to ten years in the ore body. We're told. And we're going to have an eternal problem if we dig it up. The Thank sulfides you. are nasty. I've seen what it does. You don't want that. Okay. Thank Any you. questions? Questions? Thank you. Okay. Uh, P, uh, T. P. Levitt. Sir, you and the rest of the committee have a tough nut to crack. I've, oh, got, nothing to say. I've got nothing to say that hasn't already been said 15 times. I run too Thank you very he much. Gets he yeah. gets a candy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, John. Tony Owens. That would be great if all would reflect that, but that's all right. This is your time. And then we're going to go to Ian Glass, uh, Peter Garnard. Garrett. Garrett. I'm sorry. It looks like Ann's in here, too. Uh, Peter Thompson, Ellery Queen, Jane Edwards. Keen. I'm sorry. Queen. <laughs> it's a TV show. Welcome. Thank you, Senator. I hope you won't hold it against me that I'm actually going to speak, but uh, I'll try to stay on time. 
Good afternoon. My name is Tony Owens. I'm from Cape Elizabeth. I'm an emergency physician at Maine Medical Center, and thank you for taking my testimony. I'm going to encourage your vote against LD 146. As a scientist myself, I can appreciate the challenge of understanding the basis for the rules you're evaluating geology, chemistry, hydrology, all make for a complicated decision making process if, if you only had a crystal ball. Your challenge reminds me of a February experience I had several years ago when I flew to Presque Isle to work a weekend shift in the emergency department at the Aristic Medical Center. Arriving a couple hours ahead of time, I decided to walk into town and see the sights. About eight inches of fresh snow blanketed the town with lots of plowing and shoveling. What caught my attention, however, were the number of men, young and old, shoveling off roofs. I've shingled a few roofs, shoveled some more, and even done some ice climbing. But these roofs were steep and the men were unsecured. I remember thinking I might meet a few of these brave souls later that day <laughs> in the emergency department. Sure enough, the first patient was a dislocated shoulder and the next a broken <coughs> hip. When I asked them if they had expected they might fall, they allowed in their unique down east vernacular that it had seemed unlikely. <laughs> if only they had a crystal ball. At this moment as I speak, in history on the trauma service at Maine Medical Center is, quote, falling off a roof. Accidents, no matter how unintentional, happen. The shared experience of the open pit mining industry would seem similar to the unfortunate fate of our friends from Presque Isle. No one expected or wanted to fall, but accidents happen. They happen as well with alarming frequency, even among the modern minds, as your study of the subject has shown. There can be no guarantee against toxic spills of sulfuric acid, containment ponds, mine tailings, and erosion. There's no guarantee against bankruptcy either, except the shallow pockets of the main taxpayer. This law allow, allows, excuse me, this law allows wastewater treatment to continue in perpetuity rather than set a reasonable and finite limit of 10 years. Additionally, the funds held in trust against the possibility of default are wholly inadequate to address the astronomical costs associated with cleanup. In fact, the governor, as you've heard many times today, requested $1.6 million to continue the cleanup of the Callahan mine in Blue Hill, abandoned over 40 years ago. You don't have a crystal ball, nor do these companies who will want to exploit your new rules to earn a profit. What will happen only time will tell, hopefully when no one will fall off this roof. Before I finish, I want to tell you why this is important to me. In the past, I have spoken at legislative and regulatory hearings. I have invoked the image of my grandchildren in the main we will be passing on to them. Keeping faith with their future has been paramount to me. Seven years ago, when my first granddaughter's birth was only a few months away, I shared my dream of canoeing with her when I testified promoting stronger shorefront protection. This May, just at ice out, she will join me on her first canoe camping trip. We will slip our canoe in the Johnson Pond off the Golden Road, paddle down Johnson Stream to Allagash Stream, and continue into Allagash Lake, and finally the Ice Caves campsite. Awakening before dawn the next morning, fortified against the early spring chill, with lots of hot chocolate, we'll paddle back to the mouth of the Allagash Stream where the smelt run is on. The smelt having spawned the previous night will be drifting sluggishly back downstream and lake trout, normally a fish of deep water, will be lying in ambush in the shallows of the stream entrance, accessible only for a brief time to the fly fisherman. I'll cast her smelt pattern upstream for her and hand her the rod. With a bit of luck and patience, she'll feel the strike so anticipated by all fly fishermen. The fight will be on. I will have kept faith with her future. In your deliberations, you will <clears throat> in your deliberations, you will do all you can to help us continue to keep faith with her and our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Representative Martin. Thank you very much, Dr. Owens. Not button. <laughs> I know, these rookies. Thank you for being here today, and I just want to indicate that uh, Except for the year that I was working for Ed Muskie when he was running for vice president since my college days, I've been on the Allagash every single year. Uh, and I do agree accidents do happen, but I'd like you to take a look at the spelling of a rooster. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, 
representative. Any other questions? Thank you very much. All right. Peter? Uh, Peter, Peter Garrett. Oh, I'm sorry, Ian Glass. I'm sorry. I got fascinated by the misspelling. <laughs> Ian Glass, then Peter, then Peter. Not you, this Peter, though. Welcome. How are you folks doing today? <laughs> We're getting there. Welcome. Having fun? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Ian Glass. I'm from Portland, uh, where I am a schooner captain. I talk to 200 people a day during the summertime, so I'm kind of used to this. Uh, I'm, from a, I'm from Florida originally, a native there, now a Maine resident. I lived and worked on the Gulf Coast before, during, and after the BP, Transocean, and Halliburton disaster. I have seen firsthand what a lack of regulations can, to, can do to a healthy ecosystem and the irreparable damage caused as a result. Prior to and during the disaster, I worked for a maritime oil company as an able-bodied seaman while the well was spewing incomprehensible volumes of crude oil into the Gulf. It was, a it was devastating to watch the waters I spent my life swimming and fishing in as they were suffocated and decimated by oil. About six months after the spill, I took a position as a first mate on a whale research vessel in the Gulf studying the effects of oil and corrects it. The chemical sprayed onto the oil to disperse and sink it, which is, a toxic, which is toxic to marine life and does not effectively remove it from the ocean. After two summers on the research vessel, I returned to Maine where I had started my maritime career 10 years prior. I have come to love Maine as my home in large part because this is a state that has appreciated, respected, and protected its natural resources. The resources I speak of are not paper, oil, or copper and gold, but the flora and fauna from the coast to the mountains. Maine is majestic and beautiful beyond words. Slack, short-sighted regulations of mining will abet the destruction of this breathtaking place that has such a pure and powerful attraction for people near and far. These detrimental policies should not even be considered. It is of the most utmost importance that we continue to protect our state. The clean, clear waters of Maine and a healthy, robust, renewable fishery that supports the native brook trout and the other prized species that the state is legendary for is far is worth far more now and in the future than the non-renewable non metals that rest beneath the surface. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, we're now to Peter Garrett. You got right it right. Here. I got it. I'm turning on and off my mic because it's apparently picking up. So if I forget, tell me. I usually forget the opposite way and leave it on. Yeah. Ready, Peter? Yes, I am Go ready. for it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, I guess you'll get um, my qualifications, but I, um, I'm, I'm from Winslow, although it doesn't sound as if I am. And uh, You're across the river, right? <laughs> right, across the river. <laughs> and uh, I came to Maine uh, back in, uh, um, um, uh, uh, I guess, 79, and became the state's first hazardous waste hydrogeologist. So I know something about that. And then I went up, off, off and doing some consulting, and I've been consulting about, um, 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 I guess, supplies of groundwater. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. In in your testimony, you'll you'll see, um, I guess, some equation for how to get from pyrite and add oxygen and water, and you get, um, um, some, I guess, sulfuric acid and iron. And on that sample that's going around, that's actually a sample of the kind of ore that, that you'll find. And you can see that there's about half of it is actually sulfide minerals. But I'd like to tell you a little bit, uh, um, I guess, story about a job I had a few years ago finding um, actually a groundwater supply for the Tenants Harbor um, 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 God, God, water, water District. We found a bit of pyrite in that rock, under half a percent. We didn't think it was very important. But when we started pumping the wells, so there's water coming to the wells, obviously with oxygen, because part of the rock has, has, is now in air, and it's coming towards the wells, so there's oxygen and there's water. The, um, um, uh, I guess, acidity, the um, um, uh, sulfate, and also iron went up. So Tenants Harbor had to ha had to put in a treatment system that they 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 didn't think they'd have to have, and they have to run it forever, perpetuity. So that's with half a percent of pyrite in this big rocky. But you um, 
hefted around there, there's something like 50% sulfate. So you can imagine there's quite a lot of uh, iron, which makes water turn orange when it gets oxidized, of course, and uh, also acid mine um, um, just runoff. So I'm particularly concerned about that because um, all sulfide minerals follow a similar kind of, uh, um, um, I guess, a transition. 50% um, of the rock is uh, likely uh, uh, to be that. And the rock will, when it's, uh, it's removed, is exposed to air and, of course, rainwater. So you're bound to get these same kinds of things. So if the proposed rules go into, uh, go into effect, it will be imperative that DEP staff be certain that all mining standards can contain the inevitable production of huge quantities of dissolved metals and uh, neutralize the acid, uh, 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 acid, acid drainage. Oh, I beg your point. pardon, but go on. Sorry, you're telling a great story and I'm paying attention. So is there more points that you'd like to add to your testimony? Well, yes, there's one. Okay, good. And that is that uh, I've, I've been involved in a number of, number of sites and have seen some failures with soil piles with great storms or some kind of um, uh, uh, event, which are a lot less than 500-year storms, like uh, in these rules here. I, I think it's your... It's your cell phone that's a bit too near the switch. There you go. <laughs> that's candy right there, isn't it? Sorry about that. I thought you were trying to shut me off. Right? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm concerned that, that with a failure of one of these lagoons that, you know, as we've heard on a number of occasions, okay, failures happen, that that's going to be... An, Awful thing, so I vote against. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? For questions? Yes, sir. Senator Representative Martin. Thank you very much. On the last, on the back side of your paper, yes. there is a suggestion. That's not my phone. What is it? I don't have one with me. <laughs> uh, you have a suggestion of what should be included in the rules if we adopt rules. Yes. And and do you know uh, of any? where any other state might have done something like this that we could look at? I'm afraid I don't. I'm not the right person to ask about. Okay, but well we can we can do some research. Yeah, thank you. And, and finally, uh, the, and thank you, by the way, for, for, for your suggestions um, in terms of providing. The, and, and the other point that you make, I think, is worth noting, and that is the DEP oversight. Yes. And uh, in terms of providing o oversight, uh, should it be other, should it be DEP and someone else? Even though it is somebody else, I've found that there are some, are some cases where, where DEP, of course, has, um, uh, um, I guess, eventual oversight, even if they hire another consultant to do the job. Rainstorms happen. Sometimes they happen much bigger than you expect. Sometimes, uh, in those two cases that I just mentioned there, those were soil collapses, but if you get a if you get an earthen dam, um, you know, holding I guess a lagoon, we've heard some of the things <coughs> that can happen in that case. I, I see your point because I, obviously, as an aside, we in Arusa County uh, will not have a flood danger this year in Southern Maine. Will <laughs> yes, I got that uh, because of, of the amount of snow uh, that we don't have and and you have. Yes. Uh, so I understand where you're coming from, and that's a good point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, also cluing into the, what's on the back there, the applicant must provide uh, examples of how a particular technology proposed, yada, yada. Yes. Uh, and you come from the regulatory environment before when you were with the EP. Yes. I've had the same discussion with other people, and what worried me about that concept was you're putting into uh, regulation a criteria that may be difficult to judge, such that you create a court situation later where it's debated. That is, um, you know, the DEP, let's say, accepts this example as sufficient to meet the criteria. Now you have something that can be argued in a court proceeding later where somebody says, no, it doesn't. It's not comparable enough. The license should be rejected on that basis. That mm. looked to me like a difficult criteria to be able to measure. And you probably had to do this before. So how do you react to that? Mm. 
I have to think about that and get back to you about some kind Take of Take your case. time, because I'm still fleshing it out, too. I haven't okay. come to a conclusion. All right. Th sure, thanks. And, and please, if you could, e email Bob, and he will copy the rest of the committee. That would be very Good. helpful. Any All other right. questions? Thanks. So I do see Representative Bear is here, and since we usually let legislators go first, if you'd like to come and testify. Thank you, Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, and other members of the committee. I apologize for having you have to call my name so many times. I uh, briefly just want to point out that uh, <clears throat> my chief, uh, chief commander, who had intended to testify, was unable to uh, present herself today to do so, but has submitted uh, in writing uh, our position from the tribe. And I just want to just briefly elaborate on that only, <coughs> that we do have a comprehensive position on this issue of the regulations and on the proposed land use plans, uh, especially in the northern area. Uh, we are uh, wanting to let the committee know and and Mainers know that as uh, from a tribal perspective, uh, we believe in sustainable economic development. Uh, we believe that resources are uh, there uh, to be uh, uh, utilized uh, responsibly. And so uh, whatever the plans are, uh, these regulations will attempt to uh, 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 deal with. Uh, we, we support uh, them being done right. And that includes uh, including the uh, perspectives of everyone uh, that uh, may be impacted by such plans and activities, including the tribes, uh, especially the Maliseet tribe, uh, where in the north, uh, a big part of what is being proposed to, for that region uh, will impact uh, traditional tribal homelands. Uh, we have at least four major rivers that flow north into the and with the St. John River. Uh, I speak from that perspective. I speak as a uh, member of the Malisee tribe as a whole, uh, the Holton Band of Malisee Indians in Southern Aroostook County specifically, uh, with regard to the example of Bald Mountain, although we're not quite in the watershed, uh, we're in the Benuxtuck Egg watershed, which is upriver from the St. John, and so we're kind of like out of the path. I have to speak for the seven other uh, Maliseet uh, re uh, reserves or bands that are downriver. Uh, there are eight Maliseet bands, as uh, may, uh, many of you uh, may already know, and so they're not here, so they are downriver, would be impacted. So I was uh, meeting with a tribal elder this weekend in preparation for this, and she was talking to me about this and about making sure that those uh, uh, views were, <coughs> were uh, were included, and uh, she's from uh, the Tobik Band of Maliseet Indians. I'm from the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. Close to us is the Woodstock Band of Maliseet Indians. There's Maliseet Indians. There's 14,000 Maliseet Indians up that down that watershed, the St. John River watershed. So she was there to remind me of uh, her perspective and their perspective, and I was really appreciative of it. But she said, "Don't forget this: that there are creatures and." Uh, and to remind us that, uh, for example, the salmon. Uh, the salmon are forest creatures. We think of them as sea creatures, but they're really, they're really forest creatures. And they rely on uh, uh, a watershed that is healthy for them as habitat, that we're working to remove barriers and barricades uh, to that habitat being accessed by them. If uh, we do get uh, uh, the Canadian side to remove Mactaquac, Beechwood, uh, uh, Grand Falls uh, and all these watersheds, but only to find, you know, the, what is there for habitat is, is not good for a million years. That would be a real shame because the salmon are born in the forest. They go to sea, then they come back to die in the forest. So I thought her point was, was, was important to make to you that we are impacting with these plans, with these regulations on life, uh, tribes, and other Mainers. And so whatever you end up concluding for regulations, uh, uh, just uh, uh, be aware that uh, we ought to have those perspectives as well. And again, we have uh, this, this uh, statement in writing, and uh, for your benefit, I have provided as well uh, charts, maps of that territory that I described, including the Fish River system, uh, the Allagash, St. John River, uh, and the Benextic Egg. So, thank Question you. for the representative. Thank you, Representative Bear, for coming right. down. Appreciate it. 
Okay, we're back on schedule here, more or less. Um, we have uh, Peter Thompson, Ellery Keene, Jane Edwards, and then Neil Gallagher, Jacob Ginsburg, Susan Max something. Mackenzie. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's just your writing is hard. Uh, Stephen <laughs> Herman. Herman, eight starts with an H, and David Kirsten. So we're to Peter. Is Peter here? No, Peter's He's not. In the other room this morning. He wasn't. If, if Peter is in the other room, you'd start heading over, and we'll let um, Ellery go. Ellery's here, isn't he? He was. Oh, there he is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. No. She's. Did I skip her? No, she's next. She's after Ellery. Jane's next. I will be more brief than what uh, was passed out. My name is Ellery Keene, not Queen. I'm sorry. But a lot of people have thought of him when they think of Well, they me. used to be. There really was a TV show for a while. Anyway, go get so, it. Uh, so I'm going to skip some, but I do care about creating good jobs for Maine workers, and I care about the environment. Any mining should be done so as not to pollute the water. Whether it is surface water, such as lakes or rivers, or underground water, which is often a source of drinking water for homes, businesses, are bottled and sold commercially. A good supply of clean water is essential for many kinds of business operations. Mining is very likely to pollute both surface water and groundwater unless satisfactory regulations are properly administered. The minerals of Bald Mountain and many other places in Maine will react to form acid and arsenic compounds that contaminate water, and this problem will remain long after mining operations have ended. I understand that this acidic water is intended to be kept in underground tanks that will not seep into the soil and into the groundwater, but such tanks may not be as waterproof as they need to be. If they start to leak, it may be a while before it is noticed, and more time will pass before the leak can be fixed. Much acid will have leaked into the groundwater and will be moving toward the surface water. Groundwater moves through the ground and soil, and rock formations and often interchanges with surface water. It can move both ways, and it can go long distances. I learned years ago that the Poland spring water came through rocks all the way from the White Mountains to Maine, got into layers of rock that was porous enough to move by gravity between layers of non-porous rock up and down, but in effect mostly horizontal to where it came out of a crack in the ledge near the top of a hill in Poland, Maine. It was clean. This kind of water is being put into bottles and sold at this time. That's different from groundwater. Too often human beings do not plan far enough ahead or take into consideration the terribly adverse consequences of what they do. Air, water, and food are the most important resources needed for life to continue. We need to enforce rules that will keep air and water clean enough to support life. Clean water is needed to produce the food we eat. It is well known that the effect of climate change will make it impossible to produce very much food in many places where a lot of our food comes from now. This includes places in the southwest of the United States, such as California and Texas. It is already happening. I recently learned that a large slaughterhouse in Plainview, Texas was shut down in 2013 because the prairie land in that area had become too dry to produce enough grass for the cattle to eat. The ranchers moved their cattle to where there was enough grass and to other slaughterhouses. Some California farms can't grow the crops that they recently did. I remember seeing on TV about one very large farmland owner who, instead of producing the, uh, app, uh, the fruits and vegetables that he formerly did, was now growing cactus and selling it to people in, in Mexico to eat. Maine is one of the few areas where there will be enough rain in the future to produce food. We may be sending food to California instead of from there to here. The world needs a long-range plan for survival. It should include a huge reduction in the amount of fossil fuel that we burn, it should include regulations to keep our natural water clean. 
it is more important to keep water clean in Maine to produce food than to allow mining to occur in ways that might pollute our water. Do mining in other places where there won't be enough water to grow food. Uh, so I prohibit mining in Maine. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. And next we have Jane, finally. Yes. to come down from upstairs. Is, he, is Peter Thompson come down? No. Okay. So you're up. Whoops. I do have something so to hand Jane, out. Neil, Neil, Jacob, Susan, Stephen, and David. It's not real important to look at the first page I've given you, but um, I'm going to have a quote from something on the second page. Uh, some of you may know I'm an experienced law librarian, but this time I decided to do research the way Luke Kingsbury does it. I thought he made a really good presentation. Did a good job. So he gave me the, this, the, a copy of a mining statute. I think it was chapter 653. It says in the citation 2011, but I think it was actually in the second session. Anyway, I, I, what we were doing, I'm comparing what was in the mining statute which is what's against what's in these regulations. Are the things in the mining statutes actually in the regulations that you're making a consideration of? And I found another one that Lou didn't find. There's one, the language is actually in the statute, Title 38, 480D standards, number three, harm to habitats and fisheries. The activity will not unreasonably harm any significant wildlife habitat, freshwater wetland plant habitat, threatened or endangered plant habitat, aquatic or adjacent upland habitat, travel corridor, freshwater, estuarine or marine fisheries, or other aquatic life. So I think these are all, this is a section of the statutes that should somehow be incorporated into these mining laws. They come from Title 38, Protection and Improvement of Water, it's Environmental Protection Board. But the citation at the bottom there is a mining law. And that's pretty much what I wanted to say about that. That's a mining rule or the citation? This is a mining, this language is not in the mining rule, but I think it should be. Because don't you think that what's in the mining statutes should somehow be reflected in the rules? Representative Duchesne. That's, that's the way separate. I always thought it went. No, I think you're exactly correct. I think uh, you, what you're referring to is the Natural Resources Protection Act, which the mining rules already acknowledge. So yep. if you violate this, you don't get your permit, as it is in the rules right now. Uh, I believe that's my understanding. Is yours different? Well, I, no, I guess not. If there is a, if it says in the mining rules that they will follow this entire, they have to I believe that's true. Yes. Environmental Protection Board make sure they are following this section of the. If this isn't true, I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it doesn't seem you in can, the room. <laughs> you can write and tell me about it if you want to, or too. But okay. uh, the Sue right at the law library knows how to get in touch with me. Terrific, thank you. <laughs> thank you. But, but I started from the rule, Did from great. the mm -hmm. chapter. Lou kept talking about LD8. 15 or 53 or something and I said Lou if it passed it's a chapter now and it's chapter 653 and, and so that's how I got to the statutes and, and that it applies you. in mining thank you I made that connection you did great thank you for doing exactly thank you. what we need and, and yep. could I say just one other thing yes sure. I have time yes you do you I, <laughs> turned it, I turned it off <laughs> I turned it off to yeah, go ahead. I used to work for the legislature so I take liberty sometimes <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were asking this morning whose rules would be the uh, final or ultimate rule, the federal rule law or the state law, you should ask an attorney 
you, I don't know if that means you have to ask Janet Mills or what you have to do, but I, I think there's a possibility that if the state passes a law that's stricter than a federal law, I think that there's a possibility. I'm not trying to give legal advice, but you should check it out. It is true. It, yeah. The state can be more restrictive. The state, the feds don't have a mining that, That's law, what I thought. But we can be more yeah. restrictive on water. We can be more restrictive on air, which we have been. Good. Thank you, Jane. Okay, well, Thank I you. hope you don't have to write you. and chastise me for this. <laughs> no, no, you did great. I really appreciate it. All right, Neil. Neil Gallagher. I'm going to take a two-minute break. Have a hand up. The senator quit. Yes, I'm still right. here. One of All us right. is still here. Senator Saviello in absentia, Representative Welch, <laughs> members of the Joint Committee. My name is Neil Gallagher. I'm a resident of Brunswick, and I am here to testify against LD-146. I am very concerned that LD-146 will weaken Maine's metallic mining rules and allow mining corporations to pollute our water, woods, and wildlife for centuries to come. I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania, which like Maine is an area of great natural beauty. But it is an area forever scarred by what was done in the last two centuries. The mining industry claims modern mining is different, that they can now control pollution and reclaim mining sites to their former beauty. That is simply not true. Several people have mentioned the Mount Polly mine disaster last year in British Columbia, a modern mine that had a massive tailings pond failure. Very few people in Maine know what column is. Everyone in northeastern Pennsylvania does. Column is the tailings from anthracite mining, left to form enormous heaps. There was one a few hundred yards from where I was raised in Scranton 70 years ago. It is still there. The dumps are ugly and can catch fire, and when they do, they stink, and it takes lots of time and money to extinguish them, if they can ever be extinguished. Some burn for decades. The companies that created the dumps are long gone, so it is up to the state and localities to deal with them, with some inadequate help from attacks on the mining industry. My text includes a postcard from 1908, picturing a dump fire, and a photograph from last year's Scranton Times Tribune showing another dump fire, hmm. indicating how much has or hasn't changed in 106 years. There is no anthracite in Maine, so there will be bo no burning column dumps, but the pattern will be the same. Promises, probably made in good faith, followed by inevitable accidents, which may very well turn into catastrophes, followed by abdication, followed by who knows how many years of damage to Maine's people and environment, paid for by you and me and our descendants. LD-146 will certainly not repeal Murphy's Law, and it does not require adequate upfront financial assurances, but it does allow remediation to go on for 30 years or beyond if the mine operator needs more time to clean up. On the one hand, 30 years is much too long a time to give a company to undo the damage it may do. On the other hand, it could be much too short a time. I invite you to ask the people of northeastern Pennsylvania whether the damage from mining goes away in 10 years or 30 years or even in 100 years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Okay, Jacob. Jacob. Uh, Jacob. Oh, yeah, this oh. one. Gugglesberg. Gugglesberg. No. Uh, Susan McKenzie, I think. I think you told me that. So everybody knows we got Susan, Steve, and David. We got Don Abbott, Chris Sewell, Dale Harris, Christine Bagalari, Bagalari, David Wood, and Peter Kalu, Diane Messier, and then we're to the lobbies. <laughs> so if you're out there.
still listening in. Oops. Hey, thanks. So I just kind of read through the names. Let me do it one more time. <laughs> Susan <laughs> said it was good. I was quiet. Su Susan's up. Stephen, uh, then David Kirsten, Don Abbott, Chris Sewell, Daniel Harris, Christine. How'd you say that? Bagley. Bagley. Okay, thank you. Dave, and I apologize. Dave Wood, Peter Kalin, Diane Messier, and then Messer. Messer. Messer sorry, about those are done. And then we're to the lobbies. Make sure to ask because there's some people who got. Oh, that. is there somebody here that I didn't read their name off? Okay, so when we get to the end, before we go to lobbyists, you get to go. Did you put those guys? Yes, I put them on the list. Yes, they're right at the top. Okay, so okay. go for it. And you know. Excuse me, can I ask a question, please? Sure. I'm representing an organization, but I'm certainly not a lobbyist. Would I, would I? You can go as a public. Just wait till. You're, are you on the list? Uh, but unfortunately, they told me, you know, to sign up on the lobbyist list. If you're not paid well, by are, the organization are you, are you, to be here, you're I'm yeah. sorry. You're, you're not being paid by them to be Absolutely here? Not. Yeah. No, it's fine. I'm paying them. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Bill Richards. Yeah, Bill. Yeah, I see you over here. I'm going to move you just over to the other side so you'll follow. I know. Oh, move that guy up. <laughs> I'll put you after Diane. Thank you. Okay, now we're ready. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Susan McKenzie. I've lived in Maine for 25 years. Uh, my husband and I raised our family in Waterville. We still live there. And I'm speaking in opposition to LD 146. I earned my doctorate in natural resource policy and management at the University of Michigan. And the subject of my research was freshwater systems. My research affirmed that ecological systems are difficult to model and to manage because they are exceedingly complex. Ecological systems are interrelated and interdependent. In other words, if one part of the ecosystem is compromised, even unintentionally, all parts of the system are affected. Within complex ecosystems, water is especially unpredictable because it is tenacious. Water flows at different rates of speed. Above and below ground, it moves with and against gravity and can find its way through solid rock. Maine is a water-rich state, and we celebrate that fact. Indeed, we brand the state as a recreation destination because of our freshwater resources. But where mining is concerned, water is not an asset. It's a liability. A good example, one of many, of water's dogged persistence is Scuagra Falls in New Remain. Over 12,000 years, the Bear River has scoured a 100-foot gorge through solid granite. Water is still pulsing through that gorge today. 12,000 years is a blink in the eye in geologic time, but that is the scale that you must use if you want to contemplate water treatment in perpetuity. Given the tenacious character of water, there's simply no way to ensure that contamination can be isolated under the mining site, treated in perpetuity, nor that contaminated surface or groundwater won't eventually pollute nearby lakes and rivers. Many, many years ago, I was appointed chair of the City of Waterville Conservation Commission. We were involved in creating a comprehensive plan for our city. During that process, I learned that a city or a state has three sources of capital, its people, its industry, and its natural resource base. Each must be valued and supported so the state may thrive. Together, people, industry, and natural resources are the three legs of Maine's current and future prosperity. A proposal 
that degrades one source of capital in pursuit of another is not in the best interest of this state and does not merit your support. As lawmakers who are tasked to make decisions that bring lasting benefits to the people and to the state of Maine, I strongly urge you not to weaken Maine's current mining regulations. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> Stephen, 